I think that's about everything else, uh, everything done, other than to welcome Ellis of Ellis Clark Trains at Skipton as our main speaker this morning. Lovely to see you, Ellis. Uh, and um, if anybody's got questions, um, if you'd like to type them in, we'd be happy. Or maybe you want to start off by giving a bit of background, Ellis, and the news about your lady, latest products or uh, anything that you would like us to know. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so I suppose um, our latest announcement was uh, the Pullman coaches. Um and I've got a, I can share my screen in a minute as well and um, basically go a bit uh, in, in depth with the, uh, the CAD drawings and things and uh, show you around that. Um, I've also got some Black 5, um, the first uh, molding um, shots from that in front of me as well. So um, I can show all those. And um, yeah, I thought uh, today I thought I'd just do more of an update on where we're at with different projects. Unfortunately, I don't have an announcement, but I've got plenty of updates and exciting things to show you on current projects. So uh, yeah, so I can start with that. Um, I suppose I'll start with some of the uh, the Black Five parts uh, which we received and. Um, uh, Basically, what's happening with the Black Five is it's currently finishing off the tooling stage, uh, where we've spent a long time making the molds and all the tools necessary to make the um, to make the models. Um, we've spent a lot longer at this stage than we usually would um, to make sure all it's. Um, well, basically, it's a complex model, but it goes together like a jigsaw in essence. So what we wanted to do was make sure before we do go any further, start any manufacturing, that all the parts are absolutely perfect and as good as they possibly can be. Um, so we got our uh, first parts through about a month ago and um, the, the quality on them is absolutely phenomenal. Um, for example, this is this is the smoke and firebox. As you can see, it's this is all die cast, um, and you can see inside the the quality of the metal as well. That's another big thing, actually. The uh, the quality of the metal used. Our factory is a very high end factory. Um, they'll only do things properly. They won't put the name on. Uh, well, they won't manufacture anything they think is subpar, which is brilliant for us because we don't want to make anything subpar uh so we've got a fantastic relationship with them and they love our uh, making our models um from the cads and everything because they are of such a high level of detail and such a high quality of um part finish and um choice of materials as well um we've also got the uh the smoke box that's another die cast bit we've got the the wheel inserts, again, they're die cast. And you can see these are uncleaned, by the way. They sent us all the mold parts um, uh, uncleaned so we could see exactly how they come out. And the, obviously there'll be the odd bit of flash like there that gets cleaned up obviously prior to assembly. And these are all, a few people have asked us, you don't usually get the parts without having them assembled on a ready to run model, but this is a ready to run model, not a kit, uh, but they wanted to send us all the parts so we could review them before they start any um, test assemblies or anything like that. Um, again, though, the great thing about that is um, they, um, I just lost my train of thought there. Um, the great thing about sending the, the test pieces is it saves a lot of time in the long run. So sometimes you can lose a lot of time when it comes to the sample stage, the um, decorated sample stage and things like that, making alterations where parts don't fit. Uh, the, the benefit about sending the parts before you do any fitting uh, is that then, um, you know, they all go together perfectly and everything like that. Um, so it saves a lot of time in the long run. Um, so we've also got, um, and just to show you the way, some of the ways things go together, that's, um, as I say, the boiler and the firebox. Uh, yep. And then we've got the smoke box, which joins in there. We've got, uh, we've got a cab here, 
which slots on the end like that. You can see how clean and everything it all goes together. Uh, if you're wondering why the cab's in plastic, we couldn't get it done in metal because uh, it would be too thick and it'd look um, a bit too crude. So certain parts are in plastic, certain parts in brass, certain parts in die cast. Um, we only wanted to maintain top levels of detail throughout. So to get those a mix of materials is what is um, what is best. You could do everything in plastic, but then you don't, for us, you don't get enough weight in the model. And uh, to be honest with you, that metal is such a brilliant component, for example, that, that gives so much weight, but there's so much space inside for the motor or chips, smoke, um, well, in there, for example, uh, smoke unit, everything. Um, so yeah, and just to uh, we got the tender chassis here, again, all metal. We've put a test axle in there with the axle boxes. That's, uh, we just put a spring in one side to show how it works and moves. Um, and again, this is just a few examples of how it goes together. That's these there, that encases the uh, the plunger pickups um, and they're sprung against the wheels. Um, so yeah, that's just a few samples of, uh, of the parts that I thought I'd show. Um, next, I will show a little bit, or is there any questions at this stage on the, on the Black 5 or where it's at or parts or anything like that at all? Uh, nothing so far, uh, Ellis. I've got, I have actually got a question, Ellis, oh, yeah. in yep. relation to it. Um, is, do, do you use the same manufacturer for, is, is that being produced by one manufacturer? Yes, the Black 5 is, yeah. So we've got a couple of manufacturers for different projects. Um, this one going forward, the the the, uh, the factory doing uh, the Black Five is also doing the Wickham, and we're working really close with closely with them. We've um, got a really good relationship with them. We've visited them a couple of times, and um, they're they're superb. To be honest, they really are. Um, they're uh, yeah, they're always wanting to please and improve. And if they think we've done something that's not going to work they'll they'll tell us and they'll say how, uh, what they reckon would work to amend it and improve it um the the fantastic to work with to be honest and um that especially with uh, the black five it's such a big project we want it to be 100 percent right and it's it's coming out that way um as you can see from the parts that as i say the quality of them um it's not only the the detail though it, it it's actually the quality of material used the quality of the plastic and the metal which is sometimes obviously once you've got a model painted you don't know what the metal and the plastic looks like underneath um but the quality and the finish on the plastic and metal before any paint has even gone on it is just phenomenal to be honest and uh, it, it's you know it'll it's a model that will last on a layout in anyone's collection for years upon years upon years and um yeah i'm hoping for many it'll be sort of the pride of the collection if you like almost uh, the pride of the fleet um um but it obviously it's taken a long time to get here to where we are and we've got a long way to go but it's um it's all shaping up fantastically Um, to a couple of uh, questions that have arisen. Um, how do you join the white metal parts together? How, how is it actually um, put together? Yeah, um, so that's actually... So a lot of it, believe it or not, is what we call push fit parts, whereby it's... So it's a way my CAD designer, Nikki, designs things where essentially... Essentially, soldering is the most expensive way to assemble something, if you like, um, because you get more more waste um, and it's a lot. It's a much harder skill and things. So, what we do or what Nikki does is, you want most factories glue everything. That's just the way it is. Good quality um, gluing and clean joins and things. But you want as many parts as possible to be what we call push fit whereby you don't need any adhesives or joining thing because once they push fit into place, possibly another part glued in place will hold that part in place, if you like. Um, 
the the way to do that though is to it takes a lot longer at the CAD stage because you've got to make sure there's multiple joints. Yeah. I not just hanging on sitting on one part because it's not going to sit there. So for example, we've got like and screws, of course. Sorry, screwing uh, things together as well is a big part of it. Uh, make sure I get this the right way around. Now I've moved it. Um, just as an example, you've uh, got the tender chassis here, and the uh, the coal the coal shoot of the tender sits on there like that. Now that's as you can see all slots in places there with screw joints underneath. Now that, that won't move. You've then got the front, I'm trying to spin this around without dropping it. There we go. Then got the front part of the tender, which has two lugs there and holes there. Again, these are fin fully finished, but that then push fits into there and that's held secure there. You've then got the front plate, which I should have put on first because that goes on before that, but then that push fits into there and that gets sandwiched between those parts. Then uh, I haven't brought the back of the tender, but that basically sits on there and then on top of there and everything just then pulls itself together. Um, it doesn't mean then that it does, basically it's a more rigid, strong, way of um putting a model together and um it may for example if you knock a part it's less likely to come dislodged as if it was glue a lot of parts will be glued together uh, i must admit i'm not 100 percent sure the way the factory are planning on doing this but it's probably not going to be glued at all because once you sandwich that together and then screw it to the chassis it won't come apart and that that join line there will be cleaned up as well and it'll be absolutely flush um it's brilliant as well for if i mean uh wouldn't recommend it but if anyone needs to fully disassemble the model and put it back together then again it'll uh it'll do that so yeah so that that's I'm, the sort of way i'm taking goes. then that I'm, I'm taking it then that basically that that's where the planning stage comes into where you plan to put everything together so that you've got bits that come together uh um yeah, and that you know what I mean. From, from speaking from experience, when I've taken a Elgin diesel to, to to pieces to to just put sort out the lighting, um, it can be a bit of a nightmare. Mm -hmm. But it's done in a logic. There is a logical process to it, and I, I sometimes think it's a logical process that if you're not fully aware of it, can be a bit daunting. But yeah, yeah. It, it's un, um, understandable. Um, a couple of other questions that. Have, have come up is um and what nicky said is it, it's an angled press fit so customers can open it up to change chips speakers etc yep yeah and then anthony said uh he said it's looking great and he said i'm a diesel modeler but aspire to owning a steam loco so this is the one um it appeals to me <clears throat> what appeals to me is the apparent build quality and Mm. Uh, again, um, the build quality looks excellent. So, yeah, I can yeah. see where... Um, I, I am surprised, Ellis, to be quite honest, that nobody's actually thought about the Black 5. I mean, yeah, you know, it's it's a loco that probably towards the end of Steam, most people can remember seeing. So yeah, the, it's, it's, I suppose, uh, what we're finding in in the O-Gage world is more and more ready to run... Um, comes out and stuff it's the icons that are being produced first if you like so you've got your 08s your pan your tanks your black five your a4s your a3s and obviously helgen do a lot of the diesels like the deltas the warships and um things like that so yeah um i must admit that that's why we chose the black five because we thought that it's such a logical and i think in terms of tender locomotives it was um uh they built more black fives than they did any other br uh be our built or LMS built uh, uh, than any other tender steam lock, I think, or it might have been the austerity. Anyway, uh, they built 842, so it's a lot. And like you say, there's I think 11 in preservation, I think two in rebuilds, but there's a, there's a good number running as well. And um, yeah, it, yeah, I mean, it was a good design in, in the real world as well, which helps us with the model. And I know, I know from my knowledge, limited knowledge, that there are 
quite a number of variations on the Black Five. Um, yeah. Some that I, I would think, because there were different wheelbases to the mm -hmm. uh, drive chassis, etc. But uh, it is the loco built to a specific, or are there a number of variations? Yeah. So in the early stages of research, um, we looked. Uh, I made a big spreadsheet on all the different variants of Black Fives and all the different builders. Um, and this goes for any um, any project we basically go up on doing now is what you find is you want to stick with one particular builder uh, because they all had their own quirks and ways of doing things. And even though they all got the same drawings, uh, a lot of the time they did them their way. If, if they found that in essence, you, you could have found they'd have got the drawings and they'd have gone, they'd have done it like the drawings. And then they thought, oh, this part doesn't actually go together like it should in the drawings. Therefore just oh, weld it there instead of there or river it, rivet it here instead of here and stuff like that. So we tend to stick with, so for example, on the Black Five, we're going with the Armstrong Whitworth batch of 225 locos, uh, which is the biggest single batch of Black Fives. And it mostly stayed the same throughout. We did look at all the different variants, like you say, the, the short firebox, the long firebox, the long wheelbase, the short wheelbase. But unfortunately, there were too many. You, when, P, when you say, uh, or when I say, or when people say the short firebox or long firebox, you think, oh, it's just a different firebox. But unfortunately, it's far from the case. You, the longer firebox means a different wheelbase, which means uh, different spacing in the chassis, which then pushes on the frames, which then means that the lubricators move, which then in turn means the inject, you know, inject and everything ends up, it's almost like a new model other than the tender. So in the end, we had to stick to one, um, one, uh, one build, um, i.e. the answer on Whitworth. But fortunately, they're the ones that are um, the most preserved of um the most common ones so there were plenty to look at and um yeah but um no it's a big consideration definitely when uh, when doing them hmm. uh, a, another question that's come up it's from frank nobar uh, and i apologize if i didn't get your uh, surname correct there frank uh, did the black five run in the western region around the 1960s uh <laughs> possibly i could i could probably answer that in the sense that they did run most places. Um, you could guarantee to see a Black Five uh, from Scotland to um, Bournemouth. So, um, yeah, uh, by 1960, steam was sort of disappearing. But and I, and I, from personal experience, I think steam was disappearing from Western region uh, faster than other places. I don't know what your take is on it, Alex. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that. I mean, essentially with the Black, especially in BR times, um, you could see a Black Five anywhere in the country because the, if they'd often loan them out into various places if there was, you know, if there was more traffic happening elsewhere. And with it being a mixed traffic engine as well, it, it could lend itself to lots of different tasks and things. I mean, yeah, you, you're more likely to see, you know, a 28XX, a castle or a manor or something like that. But you would it would be, you know, you could easily get away with a black five there for, you know, for a week, for example, it could have been loaned from elsewhere. I mean, it was a, you know, it was a, a national, um, in, uh, you know, a national network, if you like. So, uh, you know, and it had wheels. So <laughs> it got about, it got about. So yeah, you, you, you can definitely get away with one anywhere really in the, um, uh, crossing regions and railways, certainly, certainly. Well well, certainly, um, I, my hometown was deep in L&ER uh, on the East Coast, but um, we used to get day trips on the weekends during the summer, bringing folks to the local seaside resort, and, and you would quite regularly see Black Fives coming out of uh, the Midlands, uh, Sheffield, Leeds, coming across to, to the East Coast, so... They were, in fact, uh, occasionally, you know, they, if they had a problem with one, it would get left locally until they, they, they sorted it out and then shuffled it off back. So it, it wasn't unusual to see Black Fives knocking about the East Coast, yeah. particularly yeah. in the summer. 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I and I suppose the 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 the, the standard BR standard five, which was effectively a development of the yeah. black five. Yeah. There were what 180, 170 of them knocking about. They would, they would certainly. The standards would be shuffled all over the country, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Like you say, where, where, uh, where they were needed. If, um, if there were events going on more, or you know, a busier season, or more goods traffic um, in a certain area, then you know, they'd, they'd loan certain vehicles, and you, you know. Um, especially in the 1960s when stock was changing and like you say, diesel was coming in. Um, it was quite common to see, um, you know, a big mixture of uh, everything really. Um, so yeah, no, certainly. I, I certainly think you, 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 you've picked a, um, a, 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 a good one to model. It, it's got a, it, it, you've got a, a, a wide customer base to, to, to aim at. Shall we say it? You know, every everybody can find an excuse for buying a black five and putting yeah, it on their yeah. layout, irrespective yeah. of what they tend to prototypical model. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely, fantastic. Um, any other questions on the black five, or I might move on to the Pullman. I've I've, I've got no questions that have come through um, on the chat, Alice. So if you want to move on to your next project <laughs> yeah no uh okay so the next one is um is uh, the darstead pullmans um so obviously we've got a close working relationship with darstead and have done for a number of years now um and we announced the the darstead pullmans at um a live event in uh, in september um I, th this is something we've been working on for a long time now um with them uh we I took on a full time researcher, uh, Chris, research and development back in um, I think it was May now actually. Time flies, doesn't it? Um, uh, to um, and he's done a lot of work with this as well. Uh, but we're also working closer than ever with uh, with them in terms of the design of it and everything as well. Um, I can uh, I believe I can share my screen, uh, which I've... there we go. Um, Right, bear me one second. And just, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So um, here's the uh, here's the Pullman um, uh, CAD drawing. This is, uh, this is for a first kitchen. Um, and what I thought I'd sh show is uh, some of the features of it, the way it goes together. Um, it's, it's a new level of detail and design as well. We've really, we've really uh, got, um, I mean, basically with the Pullmans, obviously they were the most prestigious sort of vehicle on the railway coaching stock wise. So when we started researching and doing everything, we didn't want to, we wanted to get all the detail on there possible. Uh, it's still going to be manufactured in a similar way. So it's going to have die cast bogies, brass sides, um, and some plastic components like the roof where, where necessary. But uh, as you can see from this, every piece of detail is on here. It's 100% correct. Um, if you, I mean, for example, if you look at the, uh, and this is going quite slow, by the way, because it's quite a big uh, CAD drawing. Uh, let me just zoom in a bit more. There we go. As you can see from the, these are the bogies. Um, you can see the amount of detailing on there, for example, with all the brake hangers. Uh, you got the leaf springs. You got, there we go. You got the writing. You, you can see, you know, the levels we've gone to. Those are uh, moving axle boxes as well. Um, zoom out a little bit more again. And then we've put on for now, because uh, I'm sure we'll get the question. We're still, uh, we're at the testing stage at the moment of the drop head buckeye. That's our drop head uh, buckeye that we've been working on as well, uh, fitted on the ends. So uh, the factory's got that. They've agreed with the CAD drawings and everything. Currently, they're making um, 
uh, metal test samples of them. Um, they're going to come to us and then we're going to test them for strength uh, and we're going to put them through the paces for a couple of months at least, both ourselves and on a few different layouts as well. A couple of garden railway layouts as well, where the tracks um, got more inclines, declines and undulations and things like that. Um, uh, they've got the they've got sprung uh, corridor connectors and then full detail in the gangways. There's the door there. Then um, the interiors are something else. I'll just take the side off. Uh, it doesn't want to come off for some reason. Hang on. Okay, it's not playing ball. Hang on a second. There we go. Right, so this is, as you can see, the interior. I've cut the coach in half, basically, here. Uh, so as you can see, you've got all the different seats with the detailing. We've got the working table lamps. We've got uh, brass luggage racks in the sides. Um, we've got the lighting in the roofs here. So again, you can see the level of detail we've gone to on this. And again, not only is the level of detail there, but the, the way it goes together, we again, uh, lending itself to as many push fit parts as possible. It all holds itself together via um, different connections. Um, less glue in, easy, easier to disassemble should you need to. Um, but just the, the way it goes together and comes apart is just fantastic. And if, you know, if any, we very, very rarely get damages on our stuff, uh, on our items, uh, both Darstead and our own. But if you do, then we carry spares and it's easy to replace them. Um, obviously, metal buffers are standard or brass buffers turned um, or molded where necessary. So, yeah, um, as I say, that's some... Uh, some of the Pullman. Have we got any uh, any questions on that at the moment? Um, I'll start off with a question, Ellis. Uh, what period are they from? What's the sort of build date that they were? Yep. Uh, so the build date on these particular ones, because they, they built them in different... They lasted quite a while, the build build dates. And the, so each Pullman was almost different, if you like. For example, the uh, the roofs all the rivet lines um, were different on each coach, which has been an absolute nightmare. Uh, Nikki did tell me how many rivets there are on each roof, and I can't remember how many there are, but it's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds. <laughs> um, um, do you know what? Because this is Chris's project on the research side, I can't remember exactly the build dates, which is quite bad, really. Um, I do apologise, um, but I will, I'll, um, I'll get that. Um, um, I, off the top of my head, was it 1934, I believe? I, I, I do know that the, at least the LNER were using Pullmans in the 1920s. Yeah. So the, obviously the, the wooden ones came first and the, oh, I should say we're, we're focusing on the, uh, the steel sided um, yeah, right. Pullmans. Um, so that they're, they're a later, a slightly later build, but obviously were still used by the LNER and, many most in preservation as well the wooden ones were not necessarily more complex but had more alterations and more differences and things like that um yeah but um um yes so i think it was 1934 i'll, I'll double check again i should know that and that's quite bad but um <laughs> i will uh, i will double check on that I, dread, I, I suppose that dreaded person, the rivet counter, is going to be shoved out the door, aren't they? They, <laughs> they, they can't be coming and saying, oh, well, there should be five instead of six if they're going to sit there and count them all. Uh, no, exactly. It's, uh, and it, it, was, it was quite a task for Nikki to put all these rivets on because they all had to go on almost individually. And the, the rivets on the, uh, on the roof line, 
these all mirror on the inside, um, basically structural beams almost that uh, ran throughout the coach. Uh, so dependent on where the windows fall, you know, changes where these rivet lines uh, fall as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I know it was um, it was quite a task. And as I say, they all change for each different coach class. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's quite. It it really was quite a task with that. Where where were the original ones built, uh, Ellis? Um, was it Met? There was a couple of different places. I think it was Metro Cam for the majority. Right. Um, so they were UK built. They weren't. Uh, yes. Important. Yeah, they were UK built. Yeah, UK built. Um. Uh. Yeah, and uh, it's quite amazing how many are still in preservation. Actually, um, yeah. we went through and um, through our uh, production chat and um, ticked off all the ones that were preserved. I think there's about. On the one on the all the variants and names and numbers were doing, I think there was about 12 or 13 of them preserved. So, um, and in cracking condition as well, actually, uh, yes, which was really good for getting the upholstery and things like that. Oh, Nick has put a comment on these were built between 28 and 29. 28, oh, earlier than I thought, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and the, some of the ones that are still about they've, they've actually sort of refurbished haven't they you know to yes uh, they have yeah extensively and they've, made, well, they've, they've made a superb job of it. yeah they really have yeah they really have um yeah i mean i suppose one thing i should say is as we do more and more projects and hence why chris came on board um it becomes harder and harder for me to uh keep in my noggin all the uh, different information on projects without mixing it all up but um uh i'll have to one day uh, on one of these virtual um, exhibitions or videos. I'll have to have Chris sitting with me as well and he can talk a little bit about his projects and what he's doing here because um, he's done all the in-depth research for the Pullmans especially. Um, but yeah, um, um, yeah, like you say, that they, they've been extensively um, uh, repaired and refurbished for a lot of them and uh, yeah, they do look superb. What sort of uh, retail are you looking to be putting these out at? So we're going, it'll be between three and four hundred pounds retail per coach, and there'll be a multi buy discount available as well. We haven't got an exact figure yet. No. Um, it's obviously, it is more, ex you know, I'm not, I'm not naive to the fact it is more than uh, what we've sold Darstead coaches for in the past, but. Yeah. The, the thing with these was um, when we look more and more closer to it, even things like, you know, the fact that all the roofs were different with these different lip rivet lines and uh, the the end gangways and the detail there. And we, we could have done them cheaper, but because of what Pullmans are and what they were on the railways and how prestigious they were, we didn't want to underdo them, if you like. We wanted to create something superb, something you know, something to be proud of on your layout and, you know, something that really, really wows you like they were in real life. And, um, yeah, so so they are between three and 400. I mean, you know, it's 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 good value for what they are and the level of details that are going to be on this. Yeah. Um, but obviously, I'm I'm not pretending it, it's not, you know, it's more expensive than other coaches, but the reasons for why, are, you know, to be seen here. Yeah. <laughs> if you so, like. Yeah. Yeah, so perhaps somebody uh, like, uh, uh, well, I, I suppose Pete uh, Waterman or uh, Simon George, who tend to buy things in large multiples. Yes. They've got very deep pockets and fine, you know. They, yes. they, they might have a, a rake of 10 or 11 behind something, but, uh, you know, the rest of us will have to make do with two or three. Yeah, I mean, um, one thing we're always looking to do in future as well is, um, you know, we, we do, a, I mean, one of our biggest trades actually we do is part exchanging as well. All so right. A lot of people part exchange items with us to, you know, fund a bit more right. of, um, um, other things. But um, the, the other thing with our models as well is they're all, everything is built to last. Um, yeah. Years upon years upon years 
not just sat in a cabinet either or in the box, but running on the layout. And it's why we put um, a large number of Darstead Mark 1s on the, I don't know if anyone knows, but they're on the National Railway Museum's layout. Um, right. So they, they run about 20 hours a week and have been doing for about, well, it's before COVID now, actually, because uh, I wouldn't have been allowed in otherwise. Uh, so they've been running for about two years now at uh, about 20 hours a week, and they're still going, you know, strong um, mm. without any damage. I keep asking for little reports on them just to make sure they're doing their... Uh, uh, at first, it was meant to almost be a test to see uh, how long it, it would take them to wear them out because they go for honestly the stock they go through because of the constant running on that layout is incredible but no they're still running strong uh, that's, that's it, an interesting comment actually ellis in relation to the layout um for whatever reason i i had a little bit of a connection a few years ago with the layout and there was a rate there that could only be run very very infrequently uh, and you're sort of saying i want you to run them into the ground to see what happens Yes. So. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. And um, yeah, they're still running superbly well, which is great to see. It's what we want. It's what we want. Um, you know, um, it's it's almost like, you know, with some of these models, it's almost like the, uh, um, uh, it's almost like the Rolex saying of, uh, you never own one, you just look after it to the next person. So, <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. we want we want them to, you know, to last and be running. And we, we I love seeing, um, you know, seeing things we've sold and had a hand in running on layouts as well. It, it, um, it's, uh, it's quite, it's quite a thing for me, really. Um, you know, it's, it's such a big part of it, such a big part of it. Yeah. It looks absolutely superb. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and and your price point, it, all right. It, it, what your Darstead ones, you, you're retailing about what one sixty nine, one seventy, something like that. So so on the Dars on yeah the for ones. Uh, so for the mainline ones, they're one eight nine. Um, the Thompsons are two two nine. Again, they've gone up in detail again, and then. As I say, because there's so much on these as there were in real life, these yeah. are between three and four hundred. So, so it, it, it's not it's not an unexpected rise, and no. it's proportionate to the difference in the yes the the quality. Not in in a way the quality, but it's the the quality is always good. But the, this you've taken a step change to make something very special. Exactly, exactly. And it, it was, yeah, exactly that. And it, it's things like the working table lamps, for example, you know. Yeah. The, they're not cheap, but at the same time, it's, I mean, the, you know, the, the thing about Pullman's as well is if, if you've got a BR layout, for example, you're going to have a lot of BR Mark 1s and Suburbans and things running around on the whole thing, but you're only going to have one rake of Pullman's, really. Yes. Um, yeah. And these are going to be almost um oh we, we want these to be the the pride coaching fleet of a layout or of a collection and um you yeah. know something that everyone's just going to go they're just amazing that you know i've got to have some of those um uh, likewise myself um I'll, I'll hide a few away in my cabinet and things and, <laughs> and keep them <laughs> yeah have you got a layout uh, alice so um, I don't have a layout. I did once um, and I ran out. Of sp I, I bought one and I put it in my office because I didn't have room at home. And then I filled it full of stock. So I had to sell the layout. Um, and then I, do I set up a workshop at um, home, which has just become full of other stuff. So I've just ended up with a cabinet for now. <laughs> I just right. keep filling full of stock. Um it, it's time and space for me, but um, yeah, I do have ambitions of um, of having a layout at some point when uh, when the time's right. But I spend so long um, so long uh, at work and working with these and researching and everything that I never have the time to do anything myself. What well, What's the time scale for these being on sale, Alex? What uh, being on sale, probably looking at um, early 2023 for these. So they, they are still a long way off, but yeah. again, it, it's a case of um, getting them right. 
making sure they're um, you know the one hundred percent perfect uh, before we go any further. You mentioned uh, just say, when you talk about going further. You mentioned earlier about the Wickham's. What's the sort of uh, what's the state of play in relation to the Wickham trolley? Yeah, I'll just grab the latest uh, sample. Um, yeah, so this was our first engineering prototype sample, which came in September. Uh, Alice, do you want to go back to just your screen? And yeah, good idea. There we go. Um, yeah, so the Wickhams are going, uh, progressing really nicely. Uh, that was our latest sample we got in September. Um, the next sample is a fully working one with lights and everything, which hopefully we should have before the end of the year. Then we'll have a decorated sample and then we go to production. So all being well, we're looking at um, sort of early to middle of next year for delivery of those. Um, and they're going, yeah, they're just progressing really nicely. The, the, again, the tooling came out lovely in there. Uh, the, these trailers, for example, are mostly metal. Those wheels are all metal as well. Um, fully detailed and correctly profiled as the real ones were. Um, since, we, since we've uh, shown the first uh, prototype as well, pre-orders have doubled on them. So, um, yeah, uh, people, are, people are really responding to them, really liking them. Um, yeah, they're, they're going really, really well. It's, I, I've got to say, from my point of view, it, it seemed, a, I won't say a strange, but a, a very bold um, prototype to go, go for. Yes. Uh, and and um, I'm presuming that you, you've obviously thought that, that there is a market for them um, to, to, go, to go forward with them. Yeah, I mean... Um... Basically, with these, um, Nikki came to me with the CAD drawings because she uh, she used to own a, a Wickham trolley, um, and I thought they were absolutely superb. And we sort of sat down and looked at them and thought, well, they they can go on the smallest of layouts right up until the biggest of layouts, even if they're just in a little siding. They can go they can go absolutely anywhere. I mean, it would be really funny actually to see a massive um, 50 foot layout with a Wickham uh, running along the front of it, for example. I'm quite looking forward to seeing that at exhibitions. But that's the great thing about them. They can go anywhere. They're so versatile. There's so much you can do with them. Obviously you can fill them for, um, full of figures as well. Uh, with the trailers, this is um, a flatbed one, but with the plank version as well, you can put your tools in there. You can put gravel. The, They'll weather up fantastically well. You can have multiples of them on your layout. You know, sometimes they'd run in, you know, that we've got pictures of three running together and stuff. So, yeah, they're, they're sort of almost a brave choice, if you like. But, but when we actually looked into it, we thought, well, they went, they're everywhere and so many preserved as well. And we're actually doing a DCC sound version as well now. Uh, which will sound fantastic. So I had a little uh, Ford diesel engine in them as well. So um, really looking forward to putting the sound files on it and um, mm. starting them up, if you like, as well. Mm. Thank you. Um, a, a quick move on, because I, I think we're coming towards the end of um, the session. I'm not, I'm not sure Richard might... Um... Uh, we, we, we go to 11.45. Thank, thanks, Richard. I was just... Um, there's um, a question about the press flows. Where are they? Where, yep. where that was so they're just finishing off um, production. It's uh, I don't know if anyone knows as such, but there's been an um, energy shortage in China for the past couple of months now, still ongoing a bit. Um, and the factories, uh, generally speaking, getting limited to about two or three days worth of electricity a week, if you like, for manufacturing. Um, we got sent pictures of them being assembled at the moment, which is the final, the final thing. So they've all been painted, all the parts have been molded. So would you, they're meant to be leaving the factory this month. Um, I think um, that's that's the latest we've got, and that that that's what it should be. They're all coming in one batch as well, um, all liveries and everything. So sometimes. Um, 
sometimes it can, uh, you know, they can come uh, month upon month, but we're, we're receiving all those in one batch. So um, if we ship by sea, then it's looking like they're going to be January. Um, if air freight is reasonable enough, don't think it's going to be, if honest with you, because I think we're looking at too much per pallet based on how many pallets we're going to need um then it would be before the end of the year but i think it's going to be january delivery on those at the moment but it's a weird world at the moment still getting back to normal and that with the chip shortages and everything it's um yeah it's uh it's adding to our time scales if honest oh, thank you we've had a question from anthony uh any time scale update on the thompsons please the maroon ones in particular yeah, so very similar case to the press flows on those. Um, they've been, this, everything's on such a go slow at the moment, production wise. Um, and so, yeah, we're there. We're looking at the blood and custard ones, the Elizabethan stock leaving the factory in December with delivery probably February, March time. Um, and the maroon ones will probably be April onwards, I would say. Um, they're coming in a few different batches because um, there's quite a lot of um, assembly and painting and things like that. Um, but yeah, sort of early to middle of next year. It's um, yeah, it's one of those things. If if we did, if everything was uh, normal at the moment, <laughs> we'd have them by now. But yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, like everything at the moment, it's just. Um, so it's going to be quarter one for the blood and custards and quarter two for the maroon then? Yes. Yeah, I yeah. would say that's, um, yeah, that's uh, reasonable. Yeah. Hmm. Quite superb. Move, moving on from that then, Alice, a quick uh, question about future projects. Have you got anything that, uh, well, a wish list, I suppose, is probably a better that yeah. you're, not, you're not, things you'd like to do. So we've got a few projects on the go at the moment, design-wise, research-wise, everything like that. We're always asking um, for people to get in touch and, you know, say what they want to see, what, what they think the market's missing, what's been overlooked or anything like that. So we're always, always taking suggestions. We've got a bit, and the, the problem is we've got, we've got a list of probably about 50 different items on it. Yeah. Uh, right from the weird and wonderful, right up to your, um, you know, you most expected on it sort of thing. And it's, um, we're sort of constantly working through it. Um, and that's the thing about O-Gage ready to run. There's still so much to do in it. Double O's <laughs> a different matter. Um, you know, most of it's been done, although you can redo it and things like that, of course, like many are doing now. Uh, but there's so much left to do in O-Gage that, um, yeah. What would be your biggest driver then? The, the demand or the sort of, um the cost i think yeah. um it's um it's a co it, it's um sort of a multitude of a few things it's obviously demand is a big one if if we're from a business point of view if we're if we don't think we can sell enough of something then it's just not viable to unfortunately make it um but likewise <clears throat> there's some things which um might be really popular popular uh popular but are just very very expensive and difficult to manufacture um so it, it's weighing it all up and finding something and we're constantly having meetings between us um together we're actually now working um closer than ever with a lot of other manufacturers as well we've um had sort of gentleman talks with them sat down with lots of other manufacturers now and we're trying to make sure we don't clash uh, with future projects um a lot of people have been uh, have been asking that for a long while and it's something we wanted to look into and uh, we have now sat down with a few of them and um it, it's gone fantastically well and we've lit we've just openly said look this is what we're thinking of doing what are you thinking of doing and if anything's clashed we've just said well where are you what stage are you at or what you're thinking and if you know we've backed down on some that we you know, were thinking about for example and you know, it's a great way to do it. It's just um, um, we're all up for, you know, talking. With the, for me, there's no point in competing for the sake of competing. Um, so so uh, you're unlikely like to bring out an 08 sort of thing? No. <laughs> for example, yeah, no, that we wouldn't do, uh, 
wouldn't do anything like that. You know, we're not. Yeah, it, to, would, it wouldn't make business sense, would it? No, no. But and I think it, it uh, for myself as well, it would just annoy people. You know, why, yeah, why, yeah. why are you doing something again that that's already been done? You know, when yeah. there's so much left to do is sort of the case of it, if you like. Um, you know, there's a lot of that. Naturally, there'll, there'll be certain things that you know, you might end up doing again that have been done in a different way, for example. Um, that You know, there's always, um, there's, you know, that that does happen. That the You know, the, you might get duplication in something and you're like, oh, why has that been done again? And then you're like, actually, no, there's, you know, it makes sense. It falls in with something else. But, you know, we're, we're, we're speaking with lots of different manufacturers and, we're, you know, um, it's yeah, it's going really well. We're all, you know, getting along nicely. That, that from a guild perspective, that's quite good news, I think, because there has quite often been criticism that um, people don't talk to or manufacturers don't talk to one another, traders. Mm. Um, and and there's there's always been that potential that you know you go to say Dapol and say I'm thinking of doing. Uh, and they just turn around. Well, we've already done it, and you know, sort of steal the idea, um, and you know, beat you to the sort of finishing post with it, which I suppose is 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 a, a potential likelihood. But uh, if you talk to one another, and there's got to be an element of trust there, yes, sort of trust the trust you effectively what our competitors. But if, if you're not selling the same things, then effectively you're not really competing, are you? No, I mean, I suppose it, it's um, it's a di- it's um, it's a difficult one. It's it's weighing it up as well because it's uh, we're obviously we're competing because we're all doing O gauge models. But the so that that's one side of it. The other side is though at the same time you've got to be sensible. What what's the point in producing? Like you say, if if us and Apple both did O eights and brought them out at a similar time, what's the point when there's so much else to do? The great thing is, though, that we're all, all, all us as companies are looking to create the best models possible. And even if, you know, even if we're not doing the exact same prototypes, we're all doing wagons, we're all doing coaches, we're all doing locos, and you can still always compare the detail levels and the quality of the different models. And we're all, you know, we're all always looking to improve. Every company is looking to improve and produce better models all the time. And I think, I think that's fantastic in the market. I think. Um, a lot of the models coming out ready to run in Ogage now are, um, are superb. Um, if you, a lot of the, the latest models come out and wagons and things like that, if you turn them upside down now and look at, I, this, is, this is my way of doing it. It's very simple to be honest with you. But if you, if you take like a ready to run Ogage wagon now and turn it upside down and compare it to one ready to run five, 10 years ago and look at the detail underneath in the bogies on the, brake gear on the you know on the pipes and things like that the difference is actually quite phenomenal um you know it's really impressive what's what's actually there now um i think that's quite a big thing to be honest with you there's a question being um put forward from frank nobar and he's asking is is the br4 mt264 tank on your list yeah, that a lot of people have asked for that. That's the thing again. It's like um, you know, so many locos like that. Um, you know, we're everywhere in real life, and not yeah. obviously not yet done in Ogage. And well, the, well, the the uh, Batman did one in Ogage. Um, oh yes, years ago. Yeah, and, and to be quite honest, is quite a reasonable model. Um, yeah, it is quite honest. It's a, yeah, it's a it's a fairly accurate model, but. Um, can't get it. <laughs> no. the, the other thing, I suppose, Ellis, is that you're also starting to put up against the the kit market as well, aren't you? The, uh, all of the, although a, a number of kit manufacturers are, I don't say one man band, but they are small. It, it, it is small production, small levels of production. But nonetheless, there is a there is a, an availability of, of of lots of other rolling stock. Yes. Uh, yeah. Provided you're prepared to get your hands mucky and make it, put it together yourself. Definitely. Uh, so I think one of the one of the best things is because uh, I speak to a lot of the kit manufacturers as well, and I buy kits 
uh, for myself as well, even though I never get any time to actually build them. Um, but uh, speaking to a couple of them, when, when I speak really down to earth to them, um, it's a case of a lot of the ready to run gets people into Gauge to begin with. Once yeah. they're into Gauge, it's, I mean, you know, from building layouts and stuff, it, it's not just about buying a loco and putting it on the track and letting it go. You want most people uh want to build something want to do something themselves and once they bought the ready to run and got a bit of track going and they they've you know test run around it and got it then they'll be like okay right now i'm going to buy a kit of this wagon or this coach and i'm going to build it um and speaking to a lot of the kit manufacturers they say uh, generally say that the ready to run brings people into the market and from there they start buying kits and uh for example with our wickham we've spoken to a lot of the fi- uh you know a lot of figure manufacturers have got in touch and say well brilliant for us because we can produce figures that are going to fit in it likewise if uh, there's other manufacturers and like you say that it i don't it don't i don't want to sound um you know big-headed or say one-man bands or anything like that but likewise if there's smaller businesses that do um the tools or accessories or things like that that you know go line side or on the trailers or things then um um then that works for them i mean and we, you know i'm all again i'm always talking to different people in the ogage world and we're actually about to start stocking models from a company called made in manchester who do um who do line side um mostly sort of like um, tanks, if you like, fuel depot tanks, uh, oil tanks, things like that. And uh, they're, they're superb. And yeah, I think it, it's um, the more we all work together, uh, the bigger the O-Gage as a whole grows and is growing. Yeah, an, interest, an interesting sort of comparison is with um, four mil uh, modeling 25 years ago, where the likes of Bachman and that started producing really really nice bodies etc but there was a tendency for the running not to be great and i can remember articles in model railway journal sort of you know you you bought the loco and you got rid of the chassis or you did this or you did that and i I, um a recent um post i've seen where somebody's rebuilding a elgin um great western loco because um I could be wrong on it, but the suggestion is that they don't run particularly well or the running could be better than it is. Mm. And, I, and I have seen one or two people post and say it doesn't run as well as it could do. Uh, and, and so they, I suppose when you talk about sort of kit manufacturers, they're going to be around. People are going to want to buy kits um, to either improve or change or just yeah. make something completely different to what's on offer um, I mean, an example in your Black Five, somebody might want the long wheelbase, the um, long firebox ver- version with Stevenson valve gear and something else. Uh, the only way to do it is to buy a kit. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's the thing. And it is, it's kind of like any um, any in, any change in industry, um, for example, or when it, you know um, industries markets are always always changing and adapting and different different businesses come into it or different businesses change and yeah you're 100 right it's just different ways of doing it yeah definitely and there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of new o gauge businesses smaller businesses that have come into the market because of ready to run and the things they can produce to go with it you know yeah. definitely definitely thank you ellis um we're, we've sort of hit the buffers with our Final time. Um, has anybody got any last comment or question they want to ask, or can we oh, no, d- draw this to a close? I'll just quickly say hello to Andrew and Michelle uh, from Darstead as well, because I've seen they uh, they joined as well. But <laughs> he's giving a wave, and I think Michelle just popped on camera, but I think she's probably uh, wandered off. So, <laughs> uh, right. but yeah, I just thought, hey, hi Michelle, you okay? <laughs> so I just thought I'd say hello to them as well. <laughs> right okay well thanks everybody for uh taking part thank you very much ellis highly enlightening entertaining uh and delightful to see you and hear how the black five's coming i've got a, i've got an interest in that um and your pullman coaches look absolutely superb but i don't know whether i should <laughs> get a job uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> or build a layout. Um, and the Wickham trolley, it's just, it's just, it's just delightful, isn't it? It's yes, a, a lovely yes. little thing. Yeah. Um, but I, as you say, it would be nice to see one of those run on Eaton Lodge from one end of the <laughs> yeah, yeah, foot down his yeah. line. Yeah. <laughs> Quickly chased by a class 37 with 100 trucks behind it. Yes, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's beside the point. But thank you very much, Ellis. It's been delightful. Uh, and thank, thank you, you everybody for joining in. And uh, there's still plenty to see on the virtual show. Uh, there are other items, there are other uh, demonstrators, question and answer session throughout the day, and there are all the layouts to look at. And if you're wanting to do something for Christmas, you can always wend your way through the traders adverts uh, and uh, partake with some money uh, by purchasing. And uh, I'm sure Ellis would be delighted if you stopped at uh, Ellis Clark Trains and uh, placed orders for various things that he, of the beautiful goodies that he has on sale. But thanks very much, everybody, uh, and we'll see you again. Take care. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for joining. See you later. Thanks for hosting as well, guys. Okay, our pleasure. Thank you, Alice. Cheers. Good Have a good weekend, you. all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.